Chapter 6 Loketh the Useless The wash of waves covered Ross's advance until he came up against the wall not too far from the spy's perch. Whoever crouched there still leaned forward to watch Carrara. And Ross's eyes, having adjusted to the gloom of the cavern, made out the outline of head and shoulders. The next two or three minutes were the critical ones for the Terran. He must emerge on the ledge in the open before he could attack. Carrara might almost have read his mind and given conscious help. For now she went out on the point of the ledge to whistle the dolphin summons. Tino Rao's sleek head bobbed above water as he answered the girl with a bubbling squeak. Carrara knelt and the dolphin came to butt against her outheld hand. Ross heard a gasp from the watcher, a faint sound of movement. Carrara began to sing softly, her voice rippling in one of the liquid chants of her own people, the dolphin interjecting a note or two. Ross had heard them at that before, and it made perfect cover for his move. He sprang. His grasp tightened on flesh, fingers closed about thin wrists. There was a yell of astonishment and fear from the stranger as the Terran jerked him from his perch to the ledge. Ross had his opponent flattened under him before he realized that the other had offered no struggle, but lay still. What is it? Carrara's torch beam caught them both. Ross looked down into a thin brown face not too different from his own. The wide-set eyes were closed, and the mouth gaped open. Though he believed the Hawaiian unconscious, Ross still kept hold on those wrists as he moved from the sprawled body. With the girl's aid he used a length of kelp to secure the captive. The stranger wore a garment of glistening skin-tight material which covered body, legs, and feet, but left his lanky arms bare. A belt about his waist had loops for a number of objects, among them a hook-pointed knife which Ross prudently removed. Why, he is only a boy, Carrara said. Where did he come from, Ross? The Terran pointed to the wall crevice. He was up there, watching you. Her eyes were wide and round. Why? Ross dragged his prisoner back against the wall of the cave. After witnessing the fate of those who had swum ashore from the wreck, he did not like to think what motive might have brought the Hawaiian here. Again Carrara's thoughts must have matched his, for she added, but he did not even draw his knife. What are you going to do with him, Ross? That problem already occupied the Terran. The wisest move undoubtedly was to kill the native out of hand. But such ruthlessness was more than he could stomach. And if he could learn anything from the stranger, gain some knowledge of this new world and its ways, he would be twice winner. Why, this encounter might even lead to Ash. Ross. His leg. See? The girl pointed. The tight fit of the alien's clothing made the defect clear. The right leg of the stranger was shrunken and twisted. He was a cripple. What of it? Ross demanded sharply. This was no time for an appeal to the sympathies. But Carrara did not urge any modification of the bonds as he half feared she would. Instead, she sat back cross-legged, an odd, withdrawn expression making her seem remote though he could have put out his hand to touch her. His lameness, it could be a bridge, she observed, to Ross's mystification. A bridge? What do you mean? The girl shook her head. This is only a feeling, not a true thought. But also it is important. Look, I think he is waking. The lids above those large eyes were fluttering. Then with a shake of the head, the Hawaiian blinked up at them. Blank bewilderment was all Ross could read in the stranger's expression until the alien saw Carrara. Then a flood of clicking speech poured from his lips. He seemed utterly astounded when they made no answer. And the fluency of his first outburst took on a pleading note, while the expectancy of his first greeting faded away. Carrara spoke to Ross. He is becoming afraid, very much afraid. At first, I think, he was pleased, happy. But why? The girl shook her head. I do not know, 
I can only feel. Wait. Her hand rose in imperious command. She did not rise to her feet, but crawled on hands and knees to the edge of the ledge. Both dolphins were there, raising their heads well out of the water, their actions expressing unusual excitement. Ross! Carrara's voice rang loudly. Ross, they can understand him. Tino, Rao and Tawa can understand him. You mean, they understand this language? Ross found that fantastic, awesome as the abilities of the dolphins were. No, his mind. It's his mind, Ross. Somehow he thinks in patterns they can pick up and read. They do that, you know, with a few of us, but not in the same way. This is more direct, clearer. They're so excited. Ross glanced at the prisoner. The alien had wriggled about, striving to raise his head against the wall as a support. His captor pulled the Hawaiian into a sitting position, but the native accepted that aid almost as if he were not even aware of Ross's hands on his body. He stared with a kind of horrified disbelief at the bobbing dolphin heads. He is afraid, Carrara reported. He has never known such communication before. Can they ask him questions? demanded Ross. If this odd mental tie between Terran Dolphin and Hawaiian did exist, then there was a chance to learn about this world. They can try. Now he only knows fear, and they must break through that. What followed was the most unusual four-sided conversation Russ could have ever imagined. He put a question to Carrara, who relayed it to the Dolphins. In turn, they asked it mentally of the Hawaiian and conveyed his answer back via the same route. It took some time to allay the fears of the stranger. But at last the Hawaiian entered wholeheartedly into the exchange. He is the son of the Lord ruling the castle above. Carrara produced the first rational and complete answer. But for some reason he is not accepted by his own kind. Perhaps, she added on her own, it is because he is crippled. The sea is his home, as he expresses it, and he believes me to be some mythical being out of it. He saw me swimming, masked, and with the dolphins, and he is sure I change shape at will. She hesitated. Ross, I get something odd here. He does know, or thinks he knows, creatures who can appear and disappear at will. And he is afraid of their powers. Gods and goddesses, perfectly natural. Carrara shook her head. No, this is more concrete than a religious belief. Ross had a sudden inspiration. Hurriedly he described the cloaked figure who had driven the castle people from the piles of salvage. Ask him about that one. She relayed the question. Ross saw the prisoner's head jerk around. The Hawaiian looked from Carrara to her companion, a shade of speculation in his expression. He wants to know why you ask about the Foana? Surely you must well know what manner of beings they are. Listen. Ross was sure now that he had made a real discovery, though its importance he could not guess. Tell him we come from where there are no Foana. That we have powers and must know of their powers. If he could only carry on this interrogation straight and not have to depend upon a double translation. And could he even be sure his questions reached the alien undistorted? Wearily Ross sat back on his heels. Then he glanced at Carrara with a twinge of concern. If he was tired by their roundabout communication, she must be doubly so. There was a droop to her shoulders, and her last reply had come in a voice hoarse with fatigue. Abruptly he started up. That's enough, for now. Which was true. He had to have time for evaluation, to adjust to what they had learned during the steady stream of questions passed back and forth. And in that moment he was conscious of his hunger, just as his voice was paper dry from lack of drink. We need food and drink. He fumbled with his mask, but Carrara motioned him back from the water. Tawa brings. Wait. The dolphin trailed the net of containers to them. Ross unscrewed one, pulled out a bulb of fresh water. 
A second box yielded the dry wafers of emergency rations. Then, after a moment's hesitation, Ross crossed to the prisoner, cut his wrist bonds, and pressed both a bulb and a wafer into his hold. The Hawaiian watched the Terrans eat before he bit into the wafer, chewing it with vigor, turning the bulb around in his fingers with alert interest before he sucked at its contents. As Ross chewed and swallowed, mechanically and certainly with no relish, he fitted one fact to another to make a picture of this Hawaiian time period in which they were now marooned. Of course, his picture was based on facts they had learned from their captive. Perhaps he had purposely misled them or fogged some essentials. But could he have done that in a mental contact? Ross would simply have to accept everything with a certain amount of cautious skepticism. Anyway, there were the wreckers of the castle, petty lordlings setting up their holds along the coasts, preying upon the shipping which was the lifeblood of this island water world. The Terrans had seen them in action last night and today. And if the captive's information was correct, it was not only the storm's fury which brought the wave's harvest. The wreckers had some method of attracting ships to crack up on their reefs. Some method of attraction. And that force which had pulled the Terrans through the time gate. Could there be a connection? However, there remained the wreckers on the cliff. And their prey, the seafarers of the ocean, with an understandably deep enmity between them. Those two parties Ross could understand and be prepared to deal with, he thought. But there remained the Foana. And, from their prisoner's explanation, the Foana were a very different matter. They possessed a power which did not depend upon swords or ships or the natural tools and weapons of men. No, they had strengths which were unearthly, to give them superiority in all but one way, numbers. Though the Foana had their warriors and servants, as Ross had seen on the beach, they, themselves, were of another race, a very old and dying race of which few remained. How many, their enemies could not say, for the Foana had no separate identities known to the outer world. They appeared, gave their orders, levied their demands, opposed or aided as they wished, always just one or two at a time always so muffled in their cloaks that even their physical appearances remained a mystery. But there was no mystery about their powers. Ross gathered that no wrecker lord, no matter how much a leader among his own kind, how ambitious, had yet dared to oppose actively one of the Foana, though he might make a token protest against some demand from them. And certainly the captive's description of those powers in action suggested a supernatural origin of Foana knowledge, or at least for its application. But Ross thought that the answer might be that they possessed the remnants of some almost forgotten technical know-how, the heritage of a very old race. He had tried to learn something of the origin of the Foana themselves, wondering if the robed ones could be from the Galactic Empire. But the answer had come that the Foana were older than recorded time, that they had lived in the great citadel before the race of the Terran's prisoner had risen from very primitive savagery. What do we do now? Carrara broke in upon Ross's thoughts as she refastened the containers. These slaves that the wreckers take upon occasion. Maybe ash. Ross was catching at very fragile straws. He had to. And the stranger had said that able-bodied men who swam ashore relatively uninjured were taken captive. Several had been the night before. Lokith. Ross and Karara looked around. The prisoner put down the water bulb, and one of his hands made a gesture they could not mistake. He pointed to himself and repeated that word, Lokith. The Terran touched his own chest. Ross Murdoch. Perhaps the other was as impatient as he with their roundabout method of communication and had decided to try and speed it up. The Analyzer Ash had included the Analyzer with the equipment by the gate. If Ross could find that, why, then the major problem could be behind them. Swiftly he explained to Carrara, and with a vigorous nod of assent she called to Tawa, 
ordering the rest of the salvage material from the gate be brought to them. Lokith. Ross pointed to the youth. Ross. That was himself. Karara. He indicated the girl. Ross. The alien made a clicking hiss of the first name. Karara. He did better with the second. Ross carefully unpacked the box Tao had located. He had only slight knowledge of how the device worked. It was intended to record a strange language, break it down into symbols already familiar to the time agents. But could it also be used as a translator with a totally alien tongue? He could only hope that the rough handling of its journey through the gate had not damaged it and that the experiment might possibly work. Putting the box between them, he explained what he wanted, and Carrara took up the small micro-disc, speaking slowly and distinctly the same liquid syllables she had used in the dolphin song. Ross clicked the lever when she was finished, and watched the small screen. The symbols which flashed there had meaning for him right enough. He could translate what she had just taped. The machine still worked to that extent. Now he pushed the box into place before Lokith and made the visibly reluctant Hawaiian take the disc from Karara. Then through the dolphin link Ross passed on definite instructions. Would it work as well to translate a stellar tongue as it had with languages past and present of his own planet? Reluctantly Lokith began to talk to the disc, at first in a very rapid mumble and then, as there was no frightening response, with less speed and more confidence. There were symbol lines on the vista plate in accordance, and some of them made sense. Ross was elated. Ask him, can one enter the castle unseen to check on the slaves? For what reason? Ross was sure he had read those symbols correctly. Tell him, that one of our kind may be among them. Lokith did not reply so quickly this time. His eyes, grave and measuring, studied Ross, then Karara, then Ross again. There is a way, discovered by this useless one. Ross did not pay attention to the odd adjective Lokith chose to describe himself. He pressed to the important matter. Can and will he show me that way? Again that long moment of appraisal on the part of Lokith before he answered. Ross found himself reading the reply symbols aloud. If you dare, then I will lead. 